Welcome to the Post-Acute COVID-19 Exercise and Rehabilitation Project. Today we will be discussing rehabilitation for people with post-intensive care syndrome. This course is intended for educational purposes and does not replace mentorship or consultation with more experienced cardiopulmonary or acute care colleagues. The content is current at the time of dissemination. However, please remember that the evidence and science on COVID-19 is evolving rapidly and information is subject to change. I'm pleased to be joined today by two wonderful presenters who I want to introduce to you briefly before we start. Dr. Patricia Otaki, who is the Assistant Vice President for Interprofessional Education and an Associate Professor in the Physical Therapy Program at the University of Buffalo. Dr. Jim Smith, a Professor of Physical Therapy at Utica College. And my name is Hallie Zalesnik. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Professional Development for the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center's Centers for Rehab Services. All speakers today declare that we have no conflicts of interest or potential to benefit from the content of this presentation. So what we're hoping to cover today is included here in our objective. Our goal in developing today's content was really to provide you with information that is not in too much detail, but enough that you have an understanding and hopefully an interest in delving a little bit deeper and learning more about PICS. We also wanted to ensure that you would have tangible takeaways so that if you were to see a survivor of critical illness in your clinical practice in the next week, you would have a framework of understanding of PICS and the tools to get you started in an evidence-based approach to caring for that person. So we will define post-intensive care syndrome and also describe for you the triad of problems that people recovering from critical illness may experience, including not just the physical problems, but also the mental health and cognitive impairments that may be seen. We will review strategies for the examination and evaluation for the physical problems associated with PICS and describe an evidence-based intervention framework to assist in care planning. We will also discuss the importance of using a coordinated interprofessional approach to managing these problems that people with PICS may demonstrate. I want to put a plug in here for Dr. Tepper's PACER presentation that was called Anatomy, Histology, and Pathophysiology of COVID-19. As I recently tuned into it myself, I really thought that he did a fantastic job at reviewing COVID-19 and how it specifically impacts lung function in the people who are infected with the virus. So we definitely won't be discussing any of that here today. But I do just want to mention and a reminder that we all know that cases of COVID-19 are often varied in their severity of clinical presentation, and they can present or even progress as, sev as severely as resulting in respiratory failure, multi-organ failure, or sepsis. These are some of the exact conditions that result in the need for care in an intensive care or critical care unit of a hospital. As of April 27th, there were nearly 3 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide and almost 1 million in the U.S. alone. Now, specifically in the U.S., it's been very hard to track all of the hospitalizations and ICU stays for the entire country. However, the CDC's COVID-NET, which is short for Coronavirus Disease 2019 Associated Hospitalization Surveillance Network, conducts population-based surveillance for laboratory-confirmed cases of COVID-19-associated hospitalizations. COVID-NET includes information from nearly 100 counties in a total of 14 states. And these are states that are already, states and counties that are already involved in reporting data to the CDC through the Emerging Infectious, um, Emergency, Emerging Infections Program, as well as the Influenza Hospitalization Surveillance Project. The data are presented per 100,000 people, and from March 14th through April 18th, there were 9,483 laboratory-confirmed cases of COVID-19-associated hospitalizations. The rate of hospitalization was reported at 29.2 per 100,000, with the highest rate being in adults that were 65 years of age and older. Now, earlier information from COVID-NET was published that looked at data just from February 12th through March 16th. So, so again, this is very early. And at that time, there were 4,226 confirmed cases of COVID-19 
with 12% that were known to have been hospitalized and 3% that were known to have been in the ICU. However, the report at this point in time really indicated that a substantial amount of data was missing from those 4,000 or so people in terms of both hospitalizations and ICU admissions. So it seems possible that these rates of 12% and 3% might be a little bit low. And in fact, the ICU rates out of China have estimated up to 5% of people who are infected with COVID-19 requiring stays in the ICU. Now here in the US outside of COVID-19, even without considering COVID-19, we see over 5 million people who are admitted to ICUs annually. And the survival rate range is anywhere from about 70% to 90%. And that depends on the person's age, their comorbidities, and certainly the severity of the illness. We've seen post-intensive care syndrome and survivors of critical illness who have been cared for in a variety of ICUs, including general ICUs, med surge ICUs, cardiac, respiratory, trauma ICUs, and even neurologic ICUs. So while we have yet to have specific data related to PIC and survivors of COVID-19, it certainly is plausible that individuals with COVID-19 may also be susceptible to the problems that people with PIC face when they're discharged from the hospital. Now, what exactly does the term post-intensive care syndrome or PICS refer to? It was first described by the Society of Critical Care Medicine in 2012 as new or worsening impairments in physical, cognitive, or mental health status arising after critical illness and persisting beyond acute care hospitalization. We find it really important to emphasize that PICS is a syndrome and not a diagnosis. It's a constellation of problems that you may see in people who survive critical illness, and each of those individual problems may have its own etiology and diagnosis, but PICS as a whole is not the diagnosis. The term was designed to increase awareness to the problems that survivors of critical illness experience as they have substantial long-term impacts on both survivors and their families. We like to refer to this constellation of problems as the triad of problems associated with PICS, describing it in the three domains that are often impacted. And those are the physical domain, the cognitive, and the mental health domains. Physically, what we as PTs will most likely be directly targeting with our examination and interventions can include impairments in muscle strength, pulmonary function, pain, exercise capacity, low gait speed, impaired balance, and difficulty with both activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. In the cognitive domain, impairments in attention, memory, and executive functioning have been described as well as visuospatial impairments and decreased men mental processing speeds. People with PICS may also develop or have an exacerbation of mental health conditions, which could include anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. In my experience, I've actually seen a variety of clinical presentations in people with PECs from each of these domains, both in severity and in primary presenting problems. So some people may be experiencing problems across the board in all three areas, while some may present primarily with physical problems. So when you dig a bit deeper, you may find they truly also are experiencing mental health systems and or cognitive problems as well, for example. Likewise, I've seen people who come in primarily complaining of mental health or cognitive problems. And when we go through and do some testing in the physical side, we start to find that there are some underlying physical problems as well that even the person may not have been aware of. Today, we're really gonna focus on the examination, evaluation, and the treatment of those physical problems, which can occur in up to 70% of, of survivors of critical illness. And this is not to downplay the impact of the cognitive or mental health problems that they can experience. Um, and we certainly know that having those cognitive and mental health problems are part of the big picture, especially when we consider rehabilitation. But really, we just want to focus us in on the details of those physical problems today. It's important to note that while we talk about these details, we want you to keep in mind that as a whole, the impact of PICS is substantial and long term. People with PICS show an increased use of healthcare. In one study of acute respiratory distress syndrome survivors, 80% of those people had at least one admission to inpatient rehab or a skilled nursing facility or a readmission to acute care. And of those acute care readmissions, a third of them occurred within 30 days of discharge. 
In another study, also looking at acute respiratory distress syndrome survivors, at the one-year follow-up time point, 85% had followed up with at least one specialty physician, 46% had seen outpatient physical therapy, and 19% had seen outpatient occupational therapy. And as you can see here, the unemployment rates for those individuals who were employed before their critical illness are quite high at three months post-discharge, and even 30 to 40% of people remained unemployed at one in five years out. So hopefully you're thinking, wow, PICS is a problem. And with the number of ICU admissions in the United States and the survival rates associated with those, we're talking upwards of 3.5 million people that could be experiencing PICS annually. And this is a lot of people. So why is it that we don't necessarily receive outpatient physical therapy referrals for people identified as having PICS? Especially when we're uniquely prepared to address the constellation of problems through our examination and intervention methods, as well as our ability to screen for and refer out for those cognitive and mental health problems. Also, is it possible that people who are presenting with complaints of pain or decreased balance, so they show up in our clinic and they say, I have low back pain, or my balance feels off, could they actually be presenting with PICS if they've had a stay in the ICU? We have proposed in our newly published article that perhaps we as physical therapists may be able to appropriately identify these individuals and if appropriately identified, we should consider it a yellow flag in that we need to look a little deeper. Consider a common question on a medical history intake form. Have you had a recent hospitalization? Perhaps when a patient answers yes to this question, we should consider some follow-up questions such as, did you require care in an ICU? If yes, how many days were you in the ICU? And did you require mechanical ventilation or a breathing machine? For a patient who perhaps presents with a primary complaint of pain, whom you now have identified as possibly presenting with PICS from these questions, you should consider all of the domains of PICS as well as including some examination techniques that perhaps you typically would not include for someone who is presenting with only back pain. And that might help you to look for those additional impairments in things like exercise capacity or balance or pulmonary function that are potentially hiding under the surface, but they no doubt would impact your plan of care. And so from here, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over um, to Dr. Patricia Otaki, who's going to talk specifically about those components of the physical exam and evaluation. Thank you. So after having that really lovely introduction to the triad of problems that we see with post-intensive care syndrome, I'd like to share with you and describe the physical examination for individuals with PICS. And for that, I'll be using the ICF framework. And so if we look at the ICF framework shown on this slide, you can see that we have post-intensive care syndrome as our overarching condition. And then under that, we have the physical impairments, the activity limitations, and the participation restrictions. And using this ICF framework gives you a really good mental structure for how to be approaching your physical examination of these individuals. So with physical impairments, we know that there's a high incidence of pulmonary function problems, reductions in muscle strength, and in a subset of patients, pain. So you'll be thinking of those. When we think of activity limitations, there's evidence for reduced exercise capacity, slower gait speed, and problems with balance. And then in terms of participation restrictions, these individuals have challenges with performing their activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living, returning to employment and returning to driving. And of course, complicating the physical problems are their environmental setting and also the personal factors. And within the personal factors, you could have that overlay of the mental health problems that were described as well as the cognitive impairments that were described. So if we start off by looking at how to examine physical impairments, often pulmonary function problems show up as fatigue or breathlessness at rest or during activity. And so the clinical symptoms that you might see that would tip you off to um, really looking deeper at this is increased work of breathing at rest or with activities. 
Sometimes these individuals will demonstrate an ineffective cough and an inability to clear their secretions due to the respiratory muscle weakness that they have incurred, as well as a reduction in oxygen saturation due to the diffusion limitations that may be a result of their critical illness. And you will see these at rest or with activity. Um, so pulmonary functioning, pulmonary function testing is performed in a pulmonary function lab using a body plethysmograph. And from full pulmonary function testing, you get both the respiratory, the pulmonary function, um, both static and dynamic um, properties. And you also will get your muscle um, strength, inspiratory and expiratory muscle strength um, measurements as well. So if you um, suspect this, you may wanna refer your patient back to their PCP or to a pulmonologist for pulmonary function testing. However, we can certainly do spirometry, handheld spirometry right in the outpatient practice. Um, with some training and having the right equipment, a patient needs nose plugs, handheld spirometer, and you can get the um, dynamic lung function measurements right there. And of course, we all have access to oxygen pulse oximeters so that we're able to measure um, SAO2 with our patients. So in terms of muscle strengthening, um, muscle weakness, muscle strength problems, this is a true hallmark of post-intensive care syndrome. So while in the ICU, many patients develop intensive care unit associated weakness. And this is, I, um, intensive care unit associated weakness is associated with a longer length of stay in the ICU, being on a mechanical ventilator for more than um, two days, 48 hours, and also individuals that have a diagnosis of sepsis tend to have a higher incidence of ICU associated weakness. And this weakness that develops within the ICU is quite persistent and can last for many years, which is why, while well not uh, um, beyond the scope of this presentation, but it's why prevention is so incredibly important and really speaks to the very important role of early mobility and early rehabilitation in the ICU. But into, once a person is discharged from hospital after being in the ICU, it's important to continue to track this person's muscle strength. And this can be done in a couple of ways, using manual muscle testing, which we all know. That can be done using the zero to five MRC scale. However, a much more objective measure of muscle strength can be achieved using a handheld dynamometer. And the advantage of using a dynamometer includes not only this objective nature of the measurement, but also the ability to compare the patient's actual strength um, values that you're obtaining with normative strength measures for the general population. And so you'll get an idea based on the person themselves how they compare to the normal population. So both, are, um, both these strategies for muscle testing are certainly valuable, but we really advocate for considering handheld dynamometry. In a subset of people that are, um, have experienced critical illness, they will report some pain and experiencing pain. And we recommend that you use the standard pain rating scales that we're all familiar with. So certainly the numeric pain rating scale anchored with zero to 10 where the patient reports their pain in a whole number. We also have the visual analog scale, zero to 10, where the patient would indicate on a line, they would just draw a bar across that line for, to indicate the amount of pain that they have. And then also you can use the Wong Baker faces as well to assess pain. If we move into activity limitations, the first thing that we really wanna consider is exercise capacity. This has been shown repeatedly to be reduced in individuals following critical illness and reduced not only in the short term, but for potentially, there's reports where um, exercise capacity is reduced one year, five years, and even longer. Um, this is measured, has been traditionally measured with the six minute walk test because this is a very robust outcome measure and it has been validated for people with post-intensive care syndrome. The six minute walk test provides many advantages 
especially, again, the ability to compare the results with normative data from the general population. Often therapists are reluctant to use a six minute walk test with patients that have low functioning because they feel that it's beyond their patient's capacity. Oh, they can't walk for six minutes or they're not able to really get any distance. However, we really advocate for the use of this test in these situations because a low score on this test is really valuable information. And it permits long-term tracking of a person's exercise capacity. Another point to consider is that in the administration of the six minute walk test, a 30 meter walkway is recommended. However, the Academy of NeuroPT has recently recommended that a 12 meter walkway can be used to facilitate the utilization of the six minute walk test as an outcome measure in locations where a 30 meter walkway is not available. However, there's a cautionary statement is that as you shorten the walkway, shorter distances are often recorded. Gait speed is another activity um, limitation that's often reduced. And remember that gait speed is a surrogate measure for physical functioning. And it has been observed to be reduced in individuals following critical illness, especially those with reduced muscle mass. Gait speed is a very reliable and valid measure of physical functioning across many populations, including survivors of critical illness. And again, we recommend using the four meter walk test um, for gait speed in, uh, because of its robust psychometric properties. As you can see in this figure, we have gait speed on the y axis and then its correlation with or its association with um, ADLs and IADLs, falls and ambulation. If you look at the ADL and IADL um, column, you can see that gait speeds slower than 0.6 meters per second are associated with a dependence in ADL and IADL performance. Whereas gait speeds greater than one meter per second are associated with independence in ADLs. If you look at falls, gait speeds lower than one meter per second are associated with a risk for falls. And if you see this, it's really good to do some fall risk screening. And then as far as ambulation, you can see that there's four categories of function and ambulation related to gait speed. Um, certainly we know that gait speeds of greater than 1.2 meters per second um, allows a person to successfully cross the streets. In terms of the community ambulation, we have community limited community and home ambulation as the gait speeds slow down. And while these may be relevant for people in PICS, these data have been determined for people um, recovering from stroke and we um, are still waiting for that validation in the post-intensive post care syndrome population. It's also important to assess balance for people recovering from critical illness because there's a recognition that this pop patient population has an increase in injurious falls in the first year following hospital discharge. So during the history, the physical therapist can determine if balance is a problem for the patient and if so, identify the appropriate balance assessments to objectively quantify the balance impa um, impairments that may be present. So for example, the Berg balance scale is used to identify static and dynamic standing balance impairments. The functional gait assessment can be used for walking balance, um, identifying impairments in walking balance. And then the activity specific balance confidence scale is used for measuring balance confidence. And we recommend using the three balance um, assessments shown here again, due to their strong psychometric properties. When we think about participation restrictions, we need to think about the activities of daily living and the instrumental activities of daily living. And problems with ADLs are, have been shown to be increased during the first year following critical illness. The CATS ADL index has been used to identify ADL problems in people with PICS. 
The outcome measure assesses six ADLs using self or surrogate reporting. Interestingly, bathing, dressing, and continence are the most frequently identified problem areas for people with PICS. A new and worsening problems with ADLs are also observed within the first year following critical illness. The Lawton IADL is a self-report or surrogate report questionnaire that's been used with people recovering from critical illness. And it assesses the ability to perform eight IDL, IADLs necessary to function in the community. And assessing and tracking ADLs will, is very important because it will inform us as physical therapists of the need for our own um, interventions, but also um, if referral to occupational therapy is warranted. Two other participation restrictions are very important to assess. As Dr. Zelesnik mentioned, between 40 and 70% of previously employed individuals don't return to work within the first year following critical illness. Those that do return to work often experience working fewer hours, making a major occupation change, and reduced effectiveness at work. So screening for work, return to work is important, and you can do this by discussing this with your patient, and your discussion can reveal the degree to which physical problems, mental health problems, and or cognitive problems are really impacting their ability to return to work. And having this information, again, will inform physical therapy, therapist treatment goals and also referral to the relevant professionals. Also, return to driving is important to um, examine as well because approximately 33% of people recovering from critical illness are unable to return to driving within the first year following hospital discharge. To screen for return to driving, we recommend that you simply ask the person if they have resumed driving. And for those who aren't driving, but desire to return to driving, referral to occupational therapy or a comprehensive driving evaluation center should be considered. So once you have all of this information, it's really important to put your evaluation together. And in your evaluation, um, this becomes really, um, you can take all of your information and really obtain a good idea of how your patient is doing. Because of using valid and reliable outcome measures for people with PICS, you will have really robust baseline measures and you can track them over time. The other importance of using these outcome measures is that you can compare your patient's data to the normative data with the general population. And this will, again, inform you as to how the patient is doing, how the interventions are impacting the patient, and give you an idea of prognosis. And when we consider prognosis for people with post-intensive care syndrome, what has been observed is that the recovery time is protracted and may occur over months to years. So with two people that would present to um, a community-based physical therapist, such as an outpatient practice, that have the same degree of muscle um, weakness, problems with exercise capacity or balance, a person that has those problems because they had critical illness and are now recovering from that will take much, much longer to recover than a person who has those problems for other reasons. So it is important in your prognosis as you're working with people with post-intensive care syndrome to recognize that the recovery time is known to be um, protracted compared to these problems that are caused by other um, factors. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jim Smith. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join this team as we look at post-intensive care syndrome because post-intensive care syndrome really does present a complex picture when we look at the rehabilitation for recovery after this type of critical illness. And again, we expect we're going to see quite a surge of this problem among those people who have survived critical illness due to COVID-19. We have a good framework for understanding this problem 
from a long set of studies that have evaluated post-intensive care syndrome. And now we're going to be challenged to apply these to a population that's very fragile, that's very complex. And for those individuals dealing with this and their family members, they're overwhelmed. So we want to look at this framework for interventions from a risk benefit analysis. There's a lot of risk to, for them because they are uh, really at the end of their rope. Often these are patients who cannot easily participate in rehabilitation. They're tired, they're uncomfortable, they're fatigued, but the benefits that come from this are really important. We've already heard that in this population, there are persisting problems that lead to a high risk for rehospitalization, that lead to a heavy utilization of medical services, and has a collective impact on the people that is resulting in decreased quality of life. So the benefits from providing rehabilitation to these patients is great because we're able to impact those issues. However, the opportunity that this provides is somewhat challenging because of the slow recovery that often accompanies post-intensive care syndrome as it was described by Dr. Otaki. So to try and address these issues, my first recommendation is attend to prevention. Prevention is really going to be achieved during the time in the intensive care unit. There's well-established protocols for managing patients who are uh, dealing with critical illness. The Society of Critical Care Medicine has developed the A to F bundle. And within that, the E stands for exercise. And we wanna see these patients participating in rehabilitation interventions so that there is a lower impact as they transition out of the ICU. Prevention is also important while they're hospitalized. The effects of inactivity are almost overwhelming on the body. So we need to have patients participating in rehabilitation during these times where the patients and their families and even some other caregivers may be saying, oh, you need to rest. No, actually they need physical therapy for the preventive benefits that are achieved. As these patients are transitioning from the hospital to the community, whether that is into a rehabilitation facility or home with specialized services, they're in need of special support and education. One reason for that is there's an additional problem with PICS that's called PICS family or post-intensive care syndrome family. That's a concern because the family members who have experienced their loved one being in the intensive care unit have a very high incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. So now we're seeing the challenges on the patient and on their caregivers. Combined, what we become concerned about is a caregiver burden because once the transition is made to home, these are people who are helping with the uh, performance of activities of daily living. They're helping with the instrumental activities of daily living because there is difficulty completing those as was typically done due to the combination of physical problems, cognitive problems, and mental health problems. So it's important to validate post-intensive care syndrome for those people who are experiencing it. Too often they're thinking, well, I'm not working hard enough. I'm not giving this effort that I should. And it is real important to provide them with that validation that yes, there is something called post-intensive care syndrome. It's impacting you. We are going to work on resolving these problems, but we are going to need some time to get there. While doing that, there's good literature in the critical care medicine realm about the value of diaries for people recovering after critical illness. Some of that is helped because of the cognitive problems as it gives a important framework for appreciating what types of things are happening day in and day out. And it gives them some recall with that. 
we recommend that they should also be using that type of diary for activity and exercise. One of the reasons this is informative is these are patients who are really able to tell us everything they can't do. And when we are able to look back into a diary and say, yes, we agree that you have this limitation, but compared to two weeks ago, you're doing so much more. They're able to see the trajectory of recovery and appreciate that. So try using these diaries, encourage patients uh, track their exercise and activity, both so that they are acknowledging to themselves how much activity they are doing and hopefully building on that, and also so they have that comparison for them. And finally, in this early stage, we recommend compensatory interventions are most important. Often, rehabilitation providers focus on restoration. We want to get someone back to a high level of functioning. But early on, as we're bumping up against the weakness and fatigue that create problems with activities of daily living so that patients are having troubles dressing themselves, feeding themselves, getting on and off the toilet, we need to give them the tools that make this less demanding on them and on their family members. So compensatory interventions often are assistive and adaptive devices such as canes, walkers, commodes or raised toilet seats, dressing devices so that the physical so that we're compensating for the physical limitations and using these devices to reduce the demands placed on the patients and their families. As that improves, then we move towards restoration. I do want to just um, go back to a thought I forgot to uh, bring to that last slide, and that is the other reason for restoration. It was mentioned earlier that there is a high rate of uh, utilization of resources and a high rate of rehospitalization among people experiencing post-intensive care syndrome. So when we can give them those resources so that they are more effective with activities of daily living, we're reducing the risk for rehospitalization. So as the patient transitions beyond that, they're eligible for restoration. With restoration, our goal really is to restore their abilities and achieve an optimal level of functioning for that patient. So one of the concerns we see for someone who's been hospitalized for some time is a loss of flexibility. So stretching becomes important. The stretching program is going to be unique to each patient, depending on the types of limitations they have developed. So build in stretching programs and whenever possible, build that in as part of a home exercise program that's performed by the patient and their family members. Also, early in the process, we recommend that functional training that is very task specific be utilized. Patients are now dealing with new constraints imposed by weakness or changes in motor control. They have new stiffness that they hadn't experienced before. So they may need very task specific training for things that they could do before and are reluctant to admit that they can't do now. So using that also does a nice job of building in strengthening and motor learning activities with the training that we're providing them. So make sure you're attentive to that when you're examining patients for limitations and activities of daily living so that those, those restrictions are addressed with task specific training. And then as the patient progresses, we build in more restorative interventions. Strengthening exercises are often central to the rehabilitation for someone who has uh, post-intensive care syndrome. You want to use resistance training, and we'll look at some specifics on that in a moment with the next slide, as well as aerobic training. There's going to be a level of deterioration in endurance and so we have to be focused on the aerobic training program so that that is improved. In addition, there has been good support for the use of circuit and high intensity interval training. We recommend that the article cited here, Surviving Critical Illness, What is Next? 
an expert consensus statement on physical rehabilitation after hospital discharge by Major et al. is a great resource. It's an open access article and for further information, refer there. And finally, for those patients who are experiencing deficiencies with balance, they will need a unique program for their balance problems. And that has to be customized. Some people will have a deterioration in balance due to loss of flexibility. For another, it might be a reduction in strength. And for another, it might be due to a uh, inability to recruit the desired movement patterns in an accurate or timely manner. So we need to give them necessary motor learning in that case so that we improve their balance and reduce their risk for falls. What's important here is intensity matters. What we've seen in earlier studies that looked at re rehabilitation following critical illness is it's very, very difficult to achieve the types of improvements that are valuable to patients. So we're going to need to achieve overload. With overload, we need to do this for both the resistance training and the aerobic training we're doing with these patients. The aerobic exercise intensity should be titrated to 50 to 70% of the heart rate reserve and at a board breathlessness score of three to four. That's challenging. So is the resistance training. It should be done at 70 to 80% of the person's one repetition max. And if you don't routinely use that in your practice, then you may also give resistance that demonstrates deterioration of performance somewhere around eight to 10 repetitions. That level of overload is necessary. And it's our suspicion that the reason we didn't see the improvements in earlier studies is because often the interventions were very standardized and they weren't customized to each patient with progressions that challenged the patients repeatedly to higher levels of demand to overload them. So while I'm encouraging overload, there's a balance here. And I talked earlier about the risk benefit analysis. Here's your another risk. We don't have the literature to support this, but anecdotally, we're hearing that this is a population at a high risk for decompensation. In other words, we need to be measuring their heart and rate, their respiratory rate, uh, and their oxygen saturation and blood pressure as a routine part of the interventions because the complex picture that is a post-intensive care presentation puts them at high risk for decompensation. And early reports about those people who are surviving COVID-19 suggest that there may be cardiac, pulmonary, or other problems that also put them at risk for decompensation. So there should be routine measuring of the cardiac and respiratory responses as you're providing interventions for these patients. Now, as you are working with these patients, we've made the case that there is a risk that the trajectory of recovery will be slower than you may see in a patient who has not experienced post-intensive care syndrome. And that means we need to trust that we're using adequate intensity and sufficient exercise to restore strength, to restore functioning, to restore their ability to perform activities of daily living. However, what I also recommend you do is compare that as you're working with them for other things that may be limiting their progression and slowing their advancement with these physical therapy interventions. In other words, we've heard that, or we've made the presentation that people with post-intensive care syndrome are at risk for cognitive and mental health problems. Those may also be contributing to the slowed recovery from, and, and the slowed improvement in functioning that we see with PICS. So you need to be monitoring for and screening for decreases in concentration, the presence of depression or impaired memory, 
elevated levels of anxiety or recognizing when people are having troubles with organizing and completing tasks. There's also a high risk for post-traumatic stress disorder as well as a reduction in mental processing. When these are recognized, we need to refer to other members of the healthcare team who are able to focus interventions for those problems so that we're holistically addressing the physical, the mental, and the cognitive problems that cumulatively are creating post-intensive care syndrome. So ideally, there are new concepts, new uh, follow-up clinics that are being designed to manage people after they've been in an intensive care unit. That's a great resource. However, right now those are few and far between. They tend to be concentrated in large medical centers. If you have access, that's what uh, may be best for your patient. However, for most of us, we're not in the settings or in the environments that provide those. That means that we need to be the advocate that is coordinating and communicating about post-intensive care syndrome to the other members of the healthcare team. Remember, we proposed early in this presentation that the concept of PICS is a new one and that it's not well recognized outside of the critical care community. So in the literature that most outpatient physical therapists are reading, or primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, other members of the healthcare team, we're not typically seeing the literature about post-intensive care syndrome. We need to be the advocates that bring that information to the other members of the healthcare team so that they're informed and able to contribute to the rehabilitation of our patients experiencing PICS. When we can do that, we're able to reduce the rate of hospital readmissions. We're able to reduce resource utilization, but optimally we need to do that by managing the cognitive and mental health problems that concurrently challenge our patients experiencing post-intensive care syndrome. So in summary, we wanna recommend that when you encounter patients who've been hospitalized you should ask if they've had an experience in the intensive care unit. In other words, anticipate post-intensive care syndrome because it is a constellation of problems that are very difficult to rehabilitate. And we want to recognize that early in the course of managing a patient so that we can accelerate their trajectory of recovery towards an optimal outcome. PICS involves physical problems that are of primary interest to physical therapists. Additionally, there are going to be cognitive and mental health problems that are a risk when someone has PICS. We need to monitor for those because they can impair the functioning that's so important to our patients. We recommend the application of outcome measures from the beginning of a physical therapy regimen for a patient with post-intensive care syndrome, including at the hospital level. These outcome measures allow us to prov provide information to our uh, reimbursement agencies about the impact that physical therapy is having across that whole period of recovery. There are also good touch points for patients and their family members so that they can recognize the types of improvement that are occurring over time based on their effort and participation with rehabilitation. Also, we need to appreciate the heavy burden that is placed on family members and caregivers for those people experiencing PICS. That can be overwhelming because they're providing physical help. They may be providing cueing and assistance because of the mental health or cognitive problems. So we need to look at that burden and whenever possible, reduce the burden that's being posted, uh, placed on them because if it's not managed, there will be a higher rate of healthcare utilization and the risk for rehospitalization. We want to start early in the course of rehab with compensatory interventions so that we help reduce that load on uh, people with PICS and their family members. 
And as that becomes better managed, transition to restorative interventions with a special consideration for overload so that we're providing the demands that are going to increase their physical capacity and ultimately their functioning. Remember that there is a risk for decompensation with those exercises and activities. So we need to monitor those physical responses in order to protect our patients. And we also need that information so that we can optimally increase the demands on our patients and titrate the intensity of the exercise interventions. And the last piece of this puzzle is advocate. Your patient is probably going to have problems beyond the physical realm and will need to help bring in other members of the healthcare team for the management of post-intensive care syndrome. That advocacy may mean helping others in your community appreciate the problems that accompany PICS so that they are brought into the um, treatment plan and working collaboratively with us so that our patients are able to progress and achieve an optimal outcome. So we recommend that this is a challenging population of patients to treat. It's also very rewarding. They're encountering physical problems that are real barriers to their ability to engage in their community and to return to work and driving and things that are important to them. We recommend that one of the resources that may be informative is the recently published article on home and community-based physical therapist management of adults with post-intensive care syndrome. This is an advanced article that is open access now with the journal Physical Therapy. We hope you find that informative as we hope you found this presentation to be informative as you move forward with helping people who are dealing with post-intensive care syndrome. Thank you for joining us.